Hello, and welcome to the Media Copilot, a podcast that explores how AI is changing media, journalism, and content creation. I'm Pete Paschal, longtime tech journalist and founder of the Media Copilot, and I'm excited to bring you fascinating conversations with fellow journalists, media executives, and the people building all the ways we'll create and consume news in the future. This week, I'm thrilled to welcome Dmitry Shevalenko. Dmitry is the chief business officer of Perplexity. You've probably heard of Perplexity. It's the AI search engine that's growing both in terms of popularity as well as how much funding it's attracting from venture capitalists. The company's just announced something that'll be of great interest to media companies, a partnership program. Now, when the content from a partner website is used in an answer on Perplexity, they're going to share the revenue with that partner. And where is that revenue coming from? Well, advertising, which is also new for Perplexity. Now, if you're a cynic, you might think this is a purely defensive move, that Perplexity is doing this so they don't get sued. My takeaway, though, after talking to Dimitri, is that Perplexity wants good facts and good journalism to help fuel its so-called answer engine, and it really wants to find a way to keep those facts and journalism coming. But yes, he and I do talk about all those notorious accusations about plagiarism from Forbes and Wired, what's the right way to attribute original reporting in an AI summary, and yes, that other search engine that was just announced by a competitor you might know called OpenAI. I learned a lot from our conversation, and I hope you do too. Don't forget to listen to the end where Dimitri and I talk about how publishers can create their own mini versions of perplexity on their websites, and also why the hell is it called perplexity in the first place? If you do enjoy the podcast, I'd encourage you to share it with a friend or a colleague, and I'd be grateful if you'd consider subscribing to the Media Copilot newsletter if you haven't already. I'd also really appreciate it if you'd leave a rating or review in whatever podcast app you're in. Those really do help the show get in front of more people. Lastly, you can check out everything we offer, including AI training classes for media, marketing, and PR professionals at mediacopilot.ai. Okay, okay, I'm done with the housekeeping stuff. Now, here's my conversation with Dmitry Shevalenko of Perplexity. Dmitry, thank you for stopping by the Media Copilot. Awesome. Excited to be here. Looking forward to chatting. Awesome. So I know you guys have some news, and you recently announced your publisher program. I want to get into all that, uh, and I want to get to that pretty quickly. But first, AI and even the companies in it are all still pretty new and we're all still wrapping our heads around things. And I'd really like to level set with you just a little bit on perplexity itself, if you don't mind. And, uh, you know, just sort of bring everyone up to speed on what we're even talking about here. So number one, how, how would you describe a perplexity uh, as, well as, as well as its purpose? What is perplexity's purpose? Yeah, so so the purpose of perplexity is to answer people's questions. Uh, perplexity, I, I like to talk about it as an AI answer engine, um, and and our founding insight and the thing that defined perplexity from the get go was not to use large language models or AI as a source of knowledge, but instead to use the real time internet and all all the great high quality sources on it as the input, um, you know, where where the information exists. And to use large language models and AI as a really good summarizer and synthesizer of, of that knowledge. And so it's really this marriage of a search engine uh, and uh, AI to, to do that synthesis uh, that makes perplexity you know, different and, and unique from the outset and, and something that, that we're focused on. But you, know, you, you should come to perplexity whenever you have a question uh, that you know, you, you know, the more complicated, the better. Uh, and we'll, you know, the, the site will try to answer it for you. And it seems to me that broadly, when someone wants a piece of information or some set of information, and the current way we do that obviously is with search online most of the time, and perplexity is sort of finding uh, ways to remove friction within that process generalized. I think it's um, th- there's definitely some removal of friction, but but honestly, what's really driving the behavior is it's growing the curiosity that people bring to the internet uh, because you're getting answers to questions that wouldn't have made sense to ask in Google in the first place, right? Like the the hmm. one way to think about this is the median length of a query on perplexity is ten words. Um, when's the last time you put ten words into a Google search box? 
Um, yeah, you know, from what we see in the media and query length on Google is two or three words, right? So, so people are um, using, I mean, we're all about the perplexity versus Google competition and it's, it's fun kind of, you know, social media jousting. Uh, but the reality is, is actually a bit more nuanced and interesting, which is where should growing the pie? Like people are, are mm-hmm. asking questions that they never asked before on the internet uh, because you can now use natural language questions and natural language answers. And that's, that's kind of opening up the uh, aperture for, for, for curiosity. That's, that's really interesting. I want to get into habits and what search has done and what maybe what you're alluding to that perplexity is either undoing or maybe augmenting. But I do want to get to your news. But before I even get to that, I have one more question, which is arguably just as important. What is the business model at its most basic? Um, again, we'll get to the news in a minute, but how does perplexity make money or, or even plan to make money? You know, I realize there's runway here because you're a fairly new company, but I really want to understand the framework. What is the vision? Yeah. So, so the, the first monetization product we, we had is our perplexity pro subscription, uh, which has access to a more advanced, uh, version of, of our search capability called pro search, uh, it lets you attach files. Uh, it lets you do things like voice to voice, ask questions with your voice, get an answer with your voice. Um, and, and so that is a $20 a month subscription for, for consumers. Um, and, and that started growing nicely. Uh, but, but really, we, we launched that not um, because we, we thought that was going to be our long-term model, but it was a nice validation that people found perplexity useful enough that they would be willing to pay for it, right? That's kind of a classic VC litmus test of like, hey, is, is, your, is your product good enough that somebody would want to pay for it? And you know, t- turns out the, the answer was yes. Uh, we've also, uh, in April, launched Perplexity Enterprise Pro, which is a version of Perplexity Pro that, that has the security and control features that companies want so they can make it available to their employees because you know, Perplexity, one of its superpowers is, is driving productivity uh, for folks. Um, and a lot of people were already using Perplexity as shadow IT, where you know, they're using it for work uh, in an unsanctioned uh, way. But uh, the, the long-term business model for Perplexity is advertising. Um, mm. And you know, the vast majority of our users are free users. Um, and we, we think that the thing that is uh, powerful, though, is when you start with two revenue streams, subscriptions and advertising, it doesn't force a race to the bottom on the type of advertising that, that you have to do, right? And so we don't we don't want to be in a position where the advertising experience in, in perplexity like detracts material value from a user. Um, mm-hmm. By having that diversification, we're, we're able to kind of you know balance those, those priorities um, and and kind of you know it, it lets us build higher quality advertising. Um, and so you know part part of the announcement is like yeah we we are turning on advertising and perplexity. Uh, in this coming quarter, and that that's you know how we'll be revenue sharing with, with publishers. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get to next. So um, so let's get to the news since that was a you know you did the segue for me. Yeah. So you know you're officially launching your perplexity publishers program. As I understand it, you're starting with uh, a number of the publishers that we all know: Time, Fortune, Der Spiegel, uh, Texas Tribune, and a few others. Um, and you're going to be l- both licensing the content from those sites, I guess, or or sharing in the revenue, or like what what is exactly happening here in terms of the business agreement? Yeah, so so it's it's a really simple structure. You know, if we are ourselves monetizing a page view uh, where a, a publisher's content was used to help generate the answer. Uh, we share in that in that revenue with that publisher, right? And so, um, regardless of how we got the the content to to, to be inputted as a source uh, for an answer, whether it's a direct API integration or we we crawled their site, uh, it's ultimately if, if we're using content and we're monetizing it, um, you know. We think the right uh, long-term incentive alignment is to share revenue in all those scenarios, right? Uh, and and that's kind of the crux of this program is is a long-term, multi-year uh, revenue sharing agreement where um, if we're using content, we're, we're we're sharing in that upside. Okay, so 
I, um, so you're starting with this handful of publishers and I guess what I'm curious about, and it has to do with sort of one of the, I think there was a quote in the announcement from your CEO, uh, Arvind Srinivas, and he said that it, it the goal is to create uh, a framework that's scalable and sustainable. So it seems to me that sort of doing individual deals with publishers isn't really, doesn't strike me as scalable. Is there some goal here to be more self-serve about this? Like I've, this might be a little bit selfish of me because I'm a very tiny publisher that probably doesn't appear on anyone's radar, but there's a lot of small publishers that are in between me and time. Uh, how, how do they uh, become a part of this partner partnership program? Well, well I, I think the, um, so, so absolutely. I mean, that's why we call it a program, not, you know, kind of a, you know, just one-off partnerships, right? We're not doing, and I think that's kind of where some other AI companies have unfortunately uh, gone sideways is they've, they've prioritized just the biggest publishers. Um, ultimately for us, we, we don't care whether it's, you know, one of the most famous media brands or it's an independent uh, journalist, you know, with, with their own WordPress site. And actually one of the launch partners is automatic for, for their wordpress.com publishers, right? So um, we, we, this will all be self-serve, um, you know, in, in a way almost kind of inspired by uh, what, what X has done with their creator payouts. Right. So, uh, it's, it's like, w- we want a way to send checks to, uh, publishers and creators that when, you know, their content is being used to help answer people's questions and that's being monetized, uh, with advertising. Um, you know, we, we want to share in the upside. I, I think, you know, the, the only real over time selection criteria will be, is, is it a high quality source, right? We don't want to incentivize, you know, um, I mean, our, our search engine should be filtering that out anyways, but uh, we, we want to make sure, you know, th- these are not folks that are spreading misinformation or, or, or things like that. But but otherwise, um, yeah, we'd love to have you in the publisher program. And, you know, we, we needed to just mm. start with, you know, five and six just to get it going and, you know, you know, get the mechanics uh, good. But, um, you know, we, we have a email for, you know, publishers at, at perplexity.ai. We want to get in touch with everyone. And we'll make this onboarding really smooth for folks. All right. Well, I hope the the overlords at Substack are listening and uh, take down that email. Um, so the other word he used was sustainable, and I guess that alludes, alludes to um, maybe what the rev share is. Can you talk about what sustainable means and and talk a little bit about maybe even the numbers here in terms of like when you talk about uh, sharing revenue of the monetization? Yeah, so so we're we're not getting the specific numbers. I can say, share it's uh, double digit percentages revenue share, um, and uh, we um, you know sustainable means these are not like one time you know lump sums. These are multi year agreements, and you know we're making a open ended commitment to this model, right? Uh, and and frankly, our our investors don't love that we're doing this. Uh, they they would rather we uh, try to. Uh, keep a, a margin profile uh, that's more like Google's, but um, w- we believe that uh, uh, p- part of how we compete against trillion dollar companies isn't by copying everything they do, right? And so mm-hmm. we, we think this is an important differentiator. Um, the, you know, the, the sustainable part is, uh, it, it really is that alignment incentive with, with, with revenue sharing, right? So if we're not using content, you know, there's no revenue being shared. If we are using it, uh, there's a lot being shared. Um, and it's also tied to, to kind of the success of, of advertising on perplexity, uh, which, you know, for us, that's our big bet. So um, I, I think that's sustainability. I think the other dimension of sustainability is, you know, we, we started this program, you know, way, you know, back in January is when we conceived of it before there was any of the, the recent kind of criticism of, of perplexity, um, you know, in, 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 in the media. And um, because we, we were just doing exercise of imagining, you know, what does the world look like? What also must be true of perplexity is successful. And one of those things was uh, arguably one of the most important ones is there must be a vibrant business model for the for journalism and the production of new facts about the world, right? Because that's we we don't use the expression of journalism in perplexity, but we certainly uh, the facts that 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 journalists uh, uncover uh, the truths around the, of the world uh, that is very useful in answering people's questions. And and if you know there isn't a healthy you know diverse vibrant publishing ecosystem, 
uh, that's not good for the, our ability to answer questions, right? So the scenario where we're successful and there is not a vibrant journalist ecosystem, um, that, that world can't exist, right? Either we fail, um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, but, you know, we, we, we can't succeed without journalism succeeding as well. And so this is, um, this is where we, we uh, you know, w- wanted to kind of put, put a stake in the ground saying that this is important and, you know, let, let's kind of from first principles do the thing that Google never did, uh, which is, you know, revenue sharing and, and sharing in the upside. Right. And it seems like they have no intention of doing that either, uh, even with this new era. But uh, I'll guess I'll talk to them about that. Um, so something else uh, I was thinking about, I'm just going to put my publisher hat on for a second here and get a little into the weeds on revenue, um, which is to say advertising is one part of uh, publisher revenue models today. But another significant part over the past several years has been commerce or affiliate linking. And um, often people, you know, one of the things they often type into search engines is what is the best product for something I'm trying to shop for, for example. And the whole economy has emerged in the publishing world around this with affiliate links. Um, is this in some way taken into account in yeah. Perplexity's answers? Can they pass on affiliate links in addition to the advertising? Like, how does that work? Yeah, so we actually built in a structure that if we do any kind of affiliate linking ourselves, that that would be eligible for the revenue share. Um, so we currently don't do that uh, in perplexity. Um, but if we ever were to, that that's kind of factored in. And I, I you know, something um, certainly on our list of things to look into. Uh, yeah. And, mostly. you know, I don't want to get too into the weeds of it. I obviously, you know, I've worked in publishing for a while. So I think about that. I've thought about this a lot. And in terms of like the, what the reader's looking for, you want sort of the answer to your question of what's the best thing for me. And if I'm getting that in the perplexity UI, maybe my instinct, instead of clicking on a link, if it's not there is to sort of just open up another tab and go to the recommended thing. Yep. Um, you know, the convenience of the link is great, but again, like I, the, obviously the rev share gets a little complicated. I don't think it's hard to figure out, but it's more like passing on the link and making sure that that link, um, uh, is either the publishers or I don't know, maybe it's a new kind of link. That's a hybrid. I, I, maybe someone's thought through all this, <laughs> but for me, it gets like a little complicated because then you have like all these parties that got perplexity, the publisher, the affiliate link and the retailer all all sort of grabbing some share of that. Yeah, I, I think the, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll put our, without revealing too much of our product roadmap, but we think there's a big opportunity to just like streamline how, when people are researching things, how we can make it easier for them to buy them. Um, and so I think there's definitely kind of a, a lot we can do there and, and you know, would love to kind of bring publishers who are helping generate kind of the, um, the source input on on the recommendations uh, and, and the facts around products uh, in, into the fold there as well. Nice. So you mentioned you started working on this in January, and yes, that's definitely before all the kerfuffle around perplexity recently. And I'll, I'll let's get into that in a few minutes. But January was after the famous New York Times lawsuit that was, uh, I think, hit in the week between Christmas and New Year's. And there's obviously been a lot made of that um, in the many um, uh, months since. We've seen a lot of publishers make deals with the likes of OpenAI and others, uh, obviously yourselves with this new announcement. And uh, it just seems to me there's kind of been a long and winding road sort of to get to this place where... Uh, publishers are having more direct relationships with uh, AI companies. Um, you know, there was a lot of, obviously, web scraping has been around since the web's been around. It's usually been the realm of search engines and to some extent research. Uh, everyone seemed to be okay with that. Uh, and now that that same data is being used to train LLMs, uh, things seem to have gotten really gray really fast. And, um, you know, the the... The whole sort of de facto agreement seemed to be, you know, you're going to give us traffic for indexing. Now that's sort of uh, no longer true. Um, just sort of big picture, you know, how do you how do you guys sort of see the whole sort of information ecosystem here and that sort of de facto agreement that was always sort of there between web crawling and uh, and traffic? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think our vision for like the future of this is this revenue sharing structure, which which again, Google never offered. Um, and and so th- this is, you know, we, we think actually aligns incentives on a much stronger basis than than kind of traffic links, which which can ebb and flow. Uh, and, you know, as, as publishers experience, you know, at one point, Facebook was a lot of traffic and then it died, you know, and, and so, you know, and they've kind of had those ebbs and flows with Google as well. Um, I think it's also worth, you know, just on some of the uh, the context setting you provided, you know, perplexity does not train foundation models. Uh, mm-hmm. So we we use third party LLMs or we use open source models that, that we fine tune, but we we're not in the business of scraping the web and using that to train an AI. Uh, in fact, we don't use any web content to, you know, improve uh, our, our, our AI models. Um, you know, we, we use prompt data, um, but not the actual w- web data. Uh, and, and again, we're, we're not in the business of creating foundation models wh- whatsoever. So, you know, the, the, the open AI New York Times thing that really had no bearing on, you know, our, our decision to, to launch a publisher program. And, you know, as I said, we're only 18 months old as a company um, operating in the space. And so from, from January to today is a, is a meaningful chunk of, of our uh, lifetime. So we're moving very quickly, uh, but it's not really in reaction to, you know, what others are doing. It's us kind of quickly iterating and improving on the product and, you know, taking feedback in from the market. Right. I'm glad you're here to clarify things because I think this sort of segues into the sort of, I guess I call it a kerfuffle between uh, perplexity and some publishers recently. So uh, obviously I'm referring to when uh, Forbes accused perplexity of essentially plagiarizing one of its articles. Wired seemed to jump in there and have some criticisms too. But one of the things sort of within all this, and I don't want to go over the whole thing again, uh, it's more that, um, because, but but what it speaks to sort of what you were just describing a little bit and the nuances involved, which is to say there was an accusation leveled that the uh, robots.txt file, now again, it's getting into the weeds of, of websites that, uh, basically, publishers use this as a signal to search engines and AI engines on like what you can do with their content, what's what what is allowed, so to speak. You can block training or search or at least tell the thing that's going to do that that it shouldn't do that. And there was an accusation level that's like, oh, is perplexity ignoring this because some article ended up being referenced or summarized in the engine when that site had its... Uh, site configured to, to tell it to not do that. Um, so can you clarify, like, what was that about? And like, like the, you know, that is, is, was that a mistake? Was there a, like, I know our robots.txt, as I alluded to just a second ago, is kind of the honor system on the web in some ways. But, um, uh, since you guys don't train models, but you are a search engine, um, how do you interact with it? And then what is your stance on, I guess, respecting it? Yeah, gr- gr- great tee up there. So so I think in terms of the, um, I mean, I'll, I'll first make a general comment, which is if I, if a journalist or a commentator on, on X, Twitter, uh, wants to generate a screenshot that gets uh, an AI or an LLM to say something stupid, uh, <laughs> you, you can do that all day long. Just like you can trick a person, you can trick an AI or an LLM. I don't think that type of journalism is particularly useful for uh, the public because that's not how people use these products. Like people use them not to stress test them. They use them to try to answer questions from their everyday life, their work life, and they work very well in those situations. And if they didn't, people wouldn't be using them for that. So I I think there's like, um, you know, there's kind of the stress testing and red teaming of hypothetical scenarios uh, and there's actual usage, right? And it's, it's important to distinguish between them. And it, it, it kind of brings us to uh, the, 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 the Wired example. Um, so what Wired did is they, in, in the question itself, put in a URL um, of, of a website. And when uh, you were, and that, and that URL was, was disallowed on robots.txt. Now, when, when, you, when you did that before in Perplexity, we would, on behalf of the user, go and look at the content of that URL to understand their question. But that's not crawling, right? Like robots.txt is a set of instructions for crawling. This is a user-initiated action where it's like, hey, you know, equivalent to that user 
themselves just going to that website, copying and pasting the contents and putting that into the prompt, right? And so we, gotcha. we, we, we save them the stuff. So I, I think it's a disingenuous criticism to say that robots.txt is relevant there. Uh, right, that right. Said, I see what you mean. I see the distinction. Yeah, th- th- that yeah. said, uh, because nobody actually uses perplexity that way, we, we actually, you know, block, like if, if it's a, uh, if you try to do that now, it would just say we, we can't go to that URL, right? Because we, we didn't want there to be confusion on the topic. Um, so I, I think that piece is, is um, so th- th- there's one part there. I think a second part is, you know, we, we believe that in democracies uh, in open societies, uh, there is no monopoly on facts. Um, and, and so, you know, and this is, I think, something journalists be- believe deeply too. Uh, you know, if, if Fox News says, hey, MSNBC, I don't want you using clips from Fox News in your reporting, uh, MSNBC would not adhere to that because there, there's essential information, uh, facts uh, that, that are in that reporting that MSNB wants, MSNBC wants to comment on. And so, you know, what we, uh, we, we respect robots.txt, but we do use um, summaries of web articles that are provided by others, uh, just the factual content, you know, the metadata around that uh, to answer certain questions where it's relevant. Um, and so that's, you know, we're not looking at any full text or partial text from those, from those sources, but we, we are looking at a summary of it. Uh, and I think that's that's important um, for you know information not to be uh, you know for people to, to get accurate answers um, and and honestly it's it's the basis of of an open society is that you know once a fact is reported uh, it, it is in the ether um, and I think that's been an important you know th- this has been an important principle in copyright practices going back to the 17th century uh, and you know it's not really a novel issue to uh, AI. I mean, you know, with with the the kind of blogging eco- ecosystem and aggregation, like you know, th- th- these issues have been fresh for a while. Um, uh, and 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 again, I think the 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 particular relevance here is uh, people don't use perplexity in a way that is competitive or cannibalistic to going to a news site. People come to perplexity asking a very specific question. Uh, nobody comes to perplexity asking like, what's the news today? Uh, that's just not, that's not what it's designed for. It's not what it's good at. Um, people ask, you know, these again, 10 word median length questions. Uh, and, um, and it's more like, you know, how many home runs did Babe Ruth hit in 1924? Uh, less so like, you know, you know, what, 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 what are, you know, what happened in the Dodgers uh, game you know, today? Right. Like, so, uh, I think there is um, th- th- there's a lot of uh, difference in user intent um, that that is worth worth noting here too. Cool, that's a very comprehensive answer. There's actually a lot there I'd love to unpack and go deeper on. But the point about uh, articles and material being copyright, but information isn't, is certainly well taken. Um, it's sort of the basis of the aggregation side of media that's always existed. Um, the, I think what AI and, uh, whether it's perplexity or other products bring to the table is a certain degree of scale, uh, and instantaneousness that, uh, we haven't seen before. Uh, I would also add that, um, there's a certain amount of muscle, I wouldn't call it muscle memory, um, but a set of unwritten standards when journalists tend to do it to each other, right? There's a lot of sort of uh, citing of the original source of sort of not necessarily doing a complete rewrite. There's a bunch of sort of little parts of that. Do you think perplexity could maybe do a little better job there in terms of when there's like, say a scoop or something that really is only available or, or was, was clearly the, the product of some hard work on the part of journalists um, you yeah, know, obviously yeah. this ad model that you're talking about and, and the partnership program is going to go a long way, but is there more that could be even done in the, the product itself? Yeah, I, I think the, um, our original insight again was you, you start with the sources, right? We actually list the sources before we even go into the answer. Right. Um, you know, I, I think some of the, um, critical coverage came out of this, this thing with Forbes, uh, where that actually wasn't about the core perplexity product. We had a, 
uh, experimental product called Perplexity Pages, uh, which is a bit more of a stylized answer that, that's curated. Uh, and it, it literally, it was the product was 10 days old and we were not uh, displaying sources in the same uh, format as we do on a typical answer. And it was fair feedback. And we actually changed the UI within 24 hours of that. Um, we also changed the system prompt that for uh, pages, if it does rely on a scoop, uh, it won't only list the source at the top, but like a like a journalistic convention, convention, it will in the body of the page say, you know, as reported by, um, you know, uh, the New York Times, right, as reported by Bloomberg. Um, and we actually got feedback from journalists that like, and we're incorporating this now, like, Take it a step further, say, as reported by John Smith at Bloomberg, as you know, so so mm -hmm. attribute the the individual reporter. So, I um, yeah, I mean, I I think we're uh, so it's already happened. What I'm yeah, asking. So, about. so, so we, we, we've incorporated <laughs> that feedback. Uh, I, I think there's it, it's it's the perplexity pages product is just like a very minor part of our experience, right. uh, and so I think there was some conflation between that and what people actually use us for. Um, where it's, mm. it's not as relevant a question. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I, I think it was, uh, listen, we, we think it's, um, yeah, I, I've worked at tech companies that have touched media for the bulk of my career. I was at Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at one of the first uh, mobile news aggregators called Pulse News. I remember uh, Pulse News. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, was a pretty, I was kind of a power user. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was, I was then at LinkedIn through the acquisition. Um, and so, but publishers have a legitimate right to be anxious. Uh, uh, I, I don't think any of the challenges publishers are facing today in their business models are tied to AI. But this is, you know, it, it's not unreasonable to kind of uh, get concerned about where this goes a few years from now. And, and you know, again, that, that was why we took the approach, unlike some others, of these long term revenue sharing structures uh, where, you know, we align incentives that way over kind of a one-time lump sum. Nice. Okay. So I could go even deeper on some of that, but I do want to ask you about at least, um, one other piece of big news that dropped this week. So open AI, as you probably saw, uh, recently unveiled its search product, um, and that's co coincidentally right before your guys' announcement. Fancy that. Um, and it seems to have a similar idea. It's uh, essentially an AI-powered search engine. It's got publisher partners. Um, how do you regard their approach and even uh, just competitors in the space more broadly who are putting AI together with search? Yeah, so you know, from our outset, we've... Uh, We've effectively been uh, competing against, you know, trillion-dollar companies or, or companies bankrolled by trillion-dollar companies, uh, and right. th this announcement, you know, has been teased for, uh, you know, since the beginning of this year. Um, and honestly, the 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 Chat GPT product has actually had, even in the free version, you know, web search uh, going back to the launch of GPT 4.0. Uh, right. So, so this. There's actually not that much new here. Um, I mean, th this has been, uh, you know, th this has been live for a while, and Bing has been live, and Google AI overviews. Um, all, all I can share is every time a, a competitor announces something similar, uh, our traffic just keeps going higher. Um, so it, it hasn't uh, impacted our business. I think, you, you know, at, at our core, at any startup's core, there's only two advantages you have over larger, uh, less, you know, more, more distracted incumbents, uh, velocity and focus, right? So our, our operating philosophy is 1% better every day. We make the product 1% better every day, incremental improvements, and that compounds over a year, you, you end up with a product that, that's 30 times better over the course of a year. Um, and, and so that, that, that's been, you know, you, you talk to somebody who used perplexity this point last year, and they use it today and it feels like a very different product, even though day to day, it's just small changes that, that, that compound on each other. Um, we, we think competition is great. Uh, it, you know, sharpens our focus even, even further. Um, and, uh, I, I think the more people, um, you know, get trained to ask natural language questions on the internet, 
um, that that's good. Like our, our success is ultimately tied to uh, growing global curiosity, right? If people ask more questions today than they did yesterday uh, and are trained to kind of want to ask more questions, uh, that, that, that's a good environment for, for perplexity. Um, and, you know, OpenAI is doing many things. They're trying to build AGI. They're trying to train new foundation models. They're trying to do video. Uh, all we wake up uh, and do and we dream of doing is answering people's questions. And there's a, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of benefit that comes from that focus. Yeah, it's got to be, I guess, maybe even a little flattering since, you know, you're right that they've had search in some form for quite some time now, at least since the fall. Um, though with regard to an official quote unquote search product, um, they seem to acknowledge they needed to rework their UI into something that's a little more visual um, and have more sort of prominent cited of sources, which obviously are just features built into perplexity. That said, they've got a hell of an onboarding tool with chat GPT. Um, I don't know if there's a more recent stat. I think they said something that once that they had hundred million active users, um, how do you compete with that? I, I have you guys, do you, uh, can you tell me how many active users you have? Like what is, uh, and what is sort of the percentage that maybe do pro, like what, what is your user profile look like? Yeah. So we, we tend to, as I said, think of the world through questions asked per day. Um, you mm. know, just in the last month, over 250 million questions were asked in perplexity. Uh, all of last year, it was only 500 million. Um, so we're, we're seeing, you know, very rapid growth. Um, I, I think, you know, chat GPT is an amazing tool. Uh, and you know, we have all the respect in the world for the open AI team. Uh, but one of the challenges with it is it, it, it's so useful for many different things. You don't know what's the one thing to come to it for. Uh, and, and so I think that that's going to be a persistent challenge, uh, in, in kind of these very broad AI chatbots is people don't want a chatbot, they want specific problems solved, right? The problem we solve for people is we answer their questions. Um, and so people know what to use perplexity for, and that's very powerful. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, if we're, if we're gonna, it, it's, it's one of those things, if like we were so worried about an upfront distribution advantage, you know, don't compete against Google, right? Like that, if, if, if there's a company we should be like, you know, terrified right. of, uh, it's, it's that one. Um, and yet we keep growing, right? And like, we actually grow faster the more launches they announce because in, in many ways it validates uh, that we're onto something big and, you know, we're the only player that is well-resourced, uh, but only has this to focus on uh, and um, it has a product and brand that, that our users love. Um, so yeah, we, 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 like our odds. Nice. I'd love to pick out just a couple of the details in the announcement. So you mentioned, you know, you're sharing analytics with the publishers of the links that people click on. That sounds like a big deal for publishers. Um, they always want more data on what their audience is doing. Um, how do you think they'll use that to adapt their strategy? I mean, for a long time, publishers, you know, would, would look at their traffic from search and social and adapt strategies around that. How do you, how do you adapt strategy around AI uh, search? So um, the, the the thing that is really interesting about the, this uh, new paradigm is uh, in contrast to traditional SEO, right? So we, we want publishers to know which of their articles are useful to answering people's questions because of the facts late, laden in them. Um, and then of, of those, what are the ones that kind of show up in the categories that advertisers want to reach? Uh, and that's a very powerful, because, you know, if you know the articles that are generating revenue from a rev share point of view, then you can create more of that, right? And we want to create these healthy feedback loops where publishers um, are motivated and all kinds of publishers, small ones, big ones, to create content that has the types of facts in it, verified knowledge uh, that, that is useful to answering people's questions, right? Because if there's more of those facts in the internet, uh, perplexity becomes more useful and it's, it's, it's this virtuous kind of feedback loop. Uh, and, and so I think that that's kind of what, what we, and so, so, so that's kind of what's in it for us. Uh, I think with publishers, there's all kinds of other great things, you know, I mean, they can infer based off of how their content appears in perplexity and when, how it appears in other LLMs um, and other kind of, AI products. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, 
indirect benefits that, that come from, from us kind of being open kimono there uh, that, that, that they'll appreciate over time. And just to clarify, um, you wouldn't have suffered from a favorability problem, right? Well, what I mean by this is that you obviously have some deals in place, uh, as you yeah, said, you're going to prioritize. Yeah. yeah, we're not, we're not going to, the search, uh, index and ranking system is blind to who's in the publisher program. Uh, that said, if you make more of your full text content visible to our search index and ranking system, it's more likely that when it's relevant, it will be cited as a source just because we, you know, there's a higher, a larger surface area to do that semantic match. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, so one of the other things I noticed in the agreement was the, um, you're going to be sharing some APIs. Publishers uh, presumably will be able to essentially create their own maybe mini perplexities, I guess, on their own sites so that they could sort of train on their own data. Um, that seems really interesting to me. Um, certainly chat uh, on sites, there's there's a lot of solutions for that. Um, but what is the advantage of using your guys' API in, in this case? I mean, we're really good at it and it doesn't require... Uh, you know, because we can already do that indexing, like you don't have to do anything different, right? Like the, the onboarding is, is kind of painless uh, and you can have a solution up and running right away. Uh, I, I think the other functionality that's really powerful is actually the related questions. Um, so 40% of questions in perplexity have a follow-up question. And that's, I think, you know, that, that's a powerful insight that can be relevant to publishers of, you know, how do you get people to spend more time on an article uh, and, and so opening up that API so that, you know, you can point, uh, not a question, but a URL and generate related, you know, kind of perplexity powered content to it, um, is, and keeping, you know, it's not about linking back to perplexity. It's just about creating kind of complementary content and you can pick which domains, uh, so, so that, that content can just be, you know, leveraging your, your historical content. Um, it doesn't have to like use the broader web. Um, so I think that's something we're, 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 we're excited to, uh, and publishers are excited to, to take advantage of. Cool. When I thought about this, I thought about the perplexity product itself. And, you know, as a tech guy, I'm always thinking about ways I can tweak things and customize them. Would, would, uh, the search itself perplexity, allow for a certain, ever allow for a certain amount of tailoring? And I know you have filters, which is cool, but, um, some people sort of suggest like, you know, what if you could tell it, I want this type of site only in my results, yeah, yeah. Uh, just through prompting. Like I just want blogs or whatever, you know, or, uh, I mean, you can do that with yeah. the API. You can't mm -hmm. do that. With, I mean, you, you can try to do the prompt hacking in core perplexity, but it won't work perfectly. But with the API, you can whitelist or, or blacklist certain domains, uh, that will, will, or won't show up as, as source inputs. Nice. Interesting. And what about those filters? Because I noticed that you had one that was called Reddit and on my version anyway, now it says social, but it still only shows me Reddit stuff. <laughs> like, is, is there more coming into that? And similar question for uh, video and YouTube. I only get YouTube links in that one, but the label video would seem to imply I would get other stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, like th those, uh, the focus views don't, aren't really used that often. Um, mm. We're constantly A-B testing things, but uh, it is, uh, I, I think we're just trying to reimagine what focus may look like, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not a main area of investment for us at the moment. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, cool. So I've kind of wondered that, why is it called perplexity? So, uh, so, so we're, we're going to go above my technical pay grade here, but perplexity is actually a concept in artificial intelligence, like academic literature, uh, that I will not begin to uh, explain, but what I will uh, do, and maybe you can include it in the show notes, is I'll send you a good perplexity answer for what the technical concept of perplexity means. But you know, our founders were AI PhDs, and so it was uh, it was kind of a, a geeky reference uh, to uh, a technical, uh, you know, scientific, you know, concept within AI research. Cool. I'm happy to throw that in the notes. Uh, so just to close things out, I always end most of these interviews with a question like this. Think about the future. Think about five years from now, we have a more of an AI mediated, uh, information ecosystem. What does that, that look like to the average user? And then uh, what is perplexity's role in it? 
So I, I always, um, I, I hesitate to make predictions about the future. I, I like the more Bezos uh, view of like, wh- what are the things that won't change? Um, mm. and, uh, and as it relates to, to perplexity, you know, the thing we have conviction on is the uniquely human uh, aspect of our business is curiosity and the, and the desire to ask questions. Like, you know, you, you could train uh, an AI to generate questions but you can't train an AI to want to ask questions, right? So that innate desire uh, to learn more, uh, to be curious, you know, that, that will be the driver of our business, you know, you know, five, 10, 20, 200 years into the future. Uh, And, and so, you know, that's the thing we, we focus on cultivating, you know, the, the, you know, total addressable curiosity. Uh, And, um, (laughs) and, and I think that that's going to be, you know, that that will be the evergreen part of what we do. That's a new one for me, total addressable curiosity, but somehow it's pretty fitting. Dimitri, this has been great. Thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, This is really illuminating. Really enjoy the conversation. Looking forward to coming back again soon. Awesome. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Perplexity's Dimitri Shevalenko. If you want to check out Perplexity, head on over to perplexity.ai. And if you like what you heard, please just take a minute to leave a rating or review for the Media Copilot in your podcast app. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Media Copilot newsletter and check out mediacopilot.ai for our classes on AI for journalists, marketers, and content creators. Be seeing you in the future. <laughs>